while doing my second postdoc, I uh, was also looking for jobs. So I found the job of a computational chemist at a company called Terramera, which is also in Canada, in Vancouver, on the West Coast. So that's where I've been working for the last one year. But right now, my work at the company is completely different. We do DFT, of course, but it's very, very different. And all these other thermal conductivity or high pressure research, that is my side research. I do that as a hobby right now, basically. Okay, so <clears throat> before we actually go into the results and what we did, it's very important to give a little bit of background. Now, you know, we use energy in every possible form that we, in, in our life, light, sound, heat, anything. Now, industrially, Whenever energy is used from this little diagram, you can see that 66% uh, of that energy is lost in heat. 60, that's huge. That's like two thirds, basically. And only 34%, like one third, is efficiently used up. So the idea was that, do we really want to lose this energy? Or can we somehow manage to recover the waste, wasted heat and convert it into some other useful form of energy? So this effect of transforming wasted heat energy into electrical energy was basically called the thermoelectric effect. And that's what we will be, that, that's what we have tried to do in this paper. Okay, so if you remember a little bit of high school physics or a little bit of undergrad physics, we, we did two things called Seebeck effect and Peltier effect under the, the broader umbrella of thermoelectric uh, materials. But for this, for our paper, we are particularly interested in the Seebeck effect. So what is that? So basically, uh, if you have a circuit with two different metallic strips, and if there is, if, if there, uh, is a difference of heat at the two junctions of the metallic strips, then an electric current flows through this circuit. This is called the Seebeck effect. And if you look at the equation on the left, the way it's quantized is uh, S is equal to delta V over delta T, where delta V is the voltage difference and delta T is the temperature gradient. So basically, a voltage will be developed when there is a temperature gradient. So Let's just keep this in mind because we'll need this information. Okay. Now, usually, uh, whenever I give presentations, I don't like to show a lot of equations because it gets very boring. So I promise this will be the only equation that I'll be using for this whole presentation. So uh, thermoelectric figure of merit. Now, uh, from the first slide, I said that, oh, let us try to convert wasted heat into electricity. Now. It's not possible to convert all the wasted heat into electricity. So there is obviously a conversion rate. There is an efficiency there as well. So how do we quantify that? That is quantified by something called the thermoelectric figure of merit, which is also called ZT. ZT is equal to S square sigma T divided by kappa E plus kappa L. And I'll explain all these terms. S is a Seebeck coefficient, which we saw in the previous slide. Sigma is the electrical conductivity. T is the absolute temperature. Kappa E is the electronic thermal conductivity and kappa L is the lattice thermal conductivity. So um, the lab, basically the thermal conductivity, which we are particularly interested in, it is composed of two parts. One is the electronic part, which is kappa E, and one is the vibrational part, which is kappa L. Now, <clears throat> When, we, when we're looking at this equation, the equation is actually very simple. There's, you know, it's, it, it doesn't look bad. It's not a particularly very complicated equation. So the aim should be to increase ZT as much as possible. The more we can increase ZT, it just means that we are able to convert more heat into electricity. Okay, fine. So let's do a little bit of very basic mathematics here. Uh, from this from this equation, we can see that ZT is directly proportional to the S square, which is sigma, which is the Seebeck coefficient, then the sigma, which is electrical conductivity, and the temperature. 
which means that if I am able to increase all three of them, that means my ZT will also increase. Okay. On the other hand, ZT is inversely proportional to kappa E and kappa L because they are in the denominator. So if I can decrease kappa E and decrease kappa L, my ZT will increase again. This all sounds very simple theoretically, but the problem is that these terms are not completely independent of each other. They are coupled. For example, um, if we increase sigma, then the S, which is the Seebeck coefficient, decreases. So we can't increase both the S and the sigma at the same time. If we increase one, the other one decreases. So there's a trade-off. In the same way, if we increase sigma, the kappa E also increases. And that is something that we don't want. We want kappa E and kappa L to be very low, not high. We want sigma to be very high. But from the weidmann franz law, we know that if we are increasing sigma, then kappa E is also increasing, which, which we don't want. So somebody might say that, okay, what about temperature? We can increase the temperature. Sure, we can. But there's a problem. Like, I don't want my device to work at 1000 Kelvin or 3000 Kelvin. I want these materials to work at normal room temperature so that we can use it, so that we can apply it. So temperature also is not the best parameter to play with. That means we are left only with kappa L. That is the lattice thermal conductivity, which is independent, and we can play with this one. We can try to reduce it as much as possible. That is exactly the aim of this paper, that can we decrease or reduce kappa L, or the lattice thermal conductivity, as much as possible. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the thermoelectric figure of merit, which is ZT, um, <clears throat> I told you that the more it is, the better it is, the more efficient it is. So what happened was that it was seen that initially the value of ZT was not that high, was not that great. It was below one all the time. And for a long time, throughout the 70s and the 80s, there was no improvement. It is basically this flat line over here. But in the 90s and the 2000s, it suddenly grew up. It suddenly increased a lot. And the reason was because uh, this absolutely legendary physicist, Mildred Dresselhaus, she came up with this idea that if we decrease the dimension of a material, then our kappa L or lattice thermal conductivity will also decrease. And therefore, our ZT will increase. And her theory was proven true. So you see that after, 90, after the 90s and 2000s, all these are basically in the nano scale. So basically the dimension has been reduced, maybe 1D, 2D, et cetera. And now the values are above one, in fact, more than two also at, at times. So this opened up a huge, a lot of avenues that, okay, if we decrease the physical dimension of a system, we can decrease the lattice thermal conductivity or kappa L and we can increase the thermoelectric figure of merit, which is ZT. This was basically our aim. And a lot of people have been doing a lot of work on this. Okay, so <clears throat> these are the two papers. And I, if you are interested, I would I highly suggest that please read them. They're very, very, they have fantastic physics. You can actually learn a lot from them. Um, both of them were Dresselhaus's papers. There they explained the whole physics and the mathematics behind it as to why lower dimension uh, gives rise to lower thermal conductivity. Okay. <clears throat> A few examples of 2D materials and their thermal and their ZTs and their thermoelectric figure of merit. Uh, in this case, it's graphene. And we saw that for graphene, the ZT is actually very is actually very, very small. It's only 0 0.02 at 300 Kelvin, which is very small. We want the ZT to be at least more than one. So didn't work out very well. But then came another uh, very important discovery that for chalcogenides, basically for selenides, sulfides, tellurides, at the 2D scale, basically two dimension, not bulk, the ZT increased significantly. 
So now it was, let's say on an average 0 0.58 for indium selenide, 2D indium selenide. The challenge was, can, can we increase this more? So this was a, this was a fairly recent paper, uh, although computational, it was not experimental, where Artem Ogonov's group in Russia, they saw, they saw that for tin chalcogenides, basically SNSE, uh, the ZT was actually very, very high. Like if you look at the values, they are above three, almost four, many of them are above two, et cetera. So, and this is all for 2D. This is all at the 2D scale. Nothing is, at, nothing is in the bulk regime. So a lot of work has been done with regards to these kinds of materials as well. So before we move on to our project, it's very important to say that how can we achieve low thermal conductivity or low lattice thermal conductivity? So that is something that we can achieve by following something called the SLACS criteria. So there are four of SLACS criteria. You can again read the paper. It's a pretty old paper, but very, very good. So the first criterion is that the material should have high average atomic mass. Why? So that we have low frequency phonons. The more the mass, the lower is the frequency. The heavier the mass, the lower is the frequency. And that actually helps in scattering. We will talk about scattering later on, but let's just remember that we need high average atomic mass. Number two is weak interatomic bonding. Weak interatomic bonding, again, means that the frequencies or the vibrations will be of low energy. That means the phonons will be more towards the lower frequency side, not the higher frequency. That means, again, we can have more uh, scattering. Okay, number three is high phonon scattering. And number four is high anharmonicity. This is very, very important. So the, the more the anharmonicity, the lesser will be my thermal conductivity. An example, a counter example would be diamond. Diamond has a very, very high thermal conductivity, but it has very low anharmonicity. Diamond has a tremendously high harmonicity but very small anharmonicity. And that is why the thermal conductivity of diamond is very large. We are looking for the opposite. We want low harmonicity and large anharmonicity so that we can have low thermal conductivity or low lattice thermal conductivity. Okay, so um, <clears throat> once more, just a little bit of a recap here. We are always continuously looking for low lattice thermal conductivity. Kappa L should be as low as possible. So these four criteria should be satisfied to have low thermal conductivity. These are the methods that we used for our calculations. So for example, uh, for the geometrical relaxation of the structures, we used VASP, DFT, plane wave. For the second order force constants, we used FONAPI. For the third order force constants, we used um, Sheng BT and also the thermal conductivity was calculated using Sheng BT. The Seebeck coefficient, the electrical conductivity, and the electronic thermal conductivity, basically the uh, electrical transport properties, were calculated using Bolstra. Okay. This is where we start discussing our work now. Now, <clears throat> we chose group 13 chalcogenides or AX where A is basically gallium, indium, and thallium, and X is sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. Now, the structure on the right side, which is AX2, this structure has been studied extensively in literature, both experimentally and in theory, computationally. Now, if you look at, so, so this is not our structure. This is a structure which has already been studied a lot. Now, compared to this structure, if we look at the left structure, which is AX1, and if we look at the top structure, you see they're identical. Absolutely, there's no difference. They're hexagonal, uh, same motive, everything is fine. There is no difference. But if we look at it from the side, because this one was from the top view, but if we look at it from the side, we see that there is a small difference. For AX2, 
two, basically the structure which has been studied in literature earlier, the, the group 13 atoms, that is the gallium, indium, and thallium, they occupy the middle planes, while the chalcogen, sulfur, selenium, tell tellurium, they occupy the outer planes. So the chalcogens are the green spheres, and the pink spheres represent the group 13 atoms. But in AX1, it is exactly the opposite. In AX1, this is the structure that we proposed. This is the structure that we worked with in this paper. The chalcogen atoms, the green atoms, occupy the middle planes, and the group 13 atoms occupy the outer planes. So it is different. So AX2 and AX1 are basically saying, but the, we have flipped the positions of the atoms. Okay, fine. Now, um, you know, we are dealing with selenium, tellurium, indium, etc. These are already quite heavy uh, atoms, by the way. So that means our average atomic mass is already quite high for these systems. So if you remember, that was the first criterion of slack, which I've also written at the bottom of the page, that the systems already have a slightly high average atomic mass. And that's why I have written that in green, that yes, we have satisfied this criterion. Okay, the second one was weak interatomic bonding. We needed this. So weak interatomic bonding, for that, we drew the electron localization function, which is on the right-hand side of the page. If you look at it, A, C, E, these all belong to the AX1 structure, where the chalcogen atoms occupy the middle planes and the group 13 at atoms occupy the outer planes. Whereas, whereas BDF, it's the opposite. This is, AX1, this is AX2 structure, where the chalcogen atoms occupy the outer planes, sorry, the inner planes, sorry, the chalcogens occupy the outer planes and the group 13 occupy the inner planes we can see that in our system, that is AX1, these three, there is significant uh, reduction in the bonding between the chalcogens and the group 13 atoms. So for instance, if you look here, between X in figure C, between X, it's green, which means that there is not much electron. That means the bond is quite weak. But on this side, we can see that there is, it's, it's red between the indium atoms, which means that there is a lot of electrons. That means the bonding is quite high. That means AX2 is strongly bonded, whereas our system, AX1, is weakly bonded. And that is exactly what we want. That was the second criterion of slack that we want weak and interatomic bonding. And in our structure, that is also satisfied. So here, number two is also written in green that weak interatomic bonding has been satisfied. So the first two criteria have been satisfied. What about the next two? Let's see. So <clears throat> because in our system, the interatomic bonding is very, very weak, we can see that the Young's modulus, the D by temperature, the velocity of uh, sound, etc., they are much, much lower for the AX1 system. And we have calculated this for all of them, gallium telluride, indium selenide, indium sulfide, indium telluride, thallium sulfide, selenide telluride. So for the AX1 structure, we can see that all these numbers are actually very, very low compared to the AX2 structure, where you see it's almost three times the number, like the Young's modulus is almost three times. The velocity of sound is double. The D by temperature is more than double also. So this was very, very, this, this proved that our for our system, for the AX1 system, the interatomic bonding is very weak. And that's what we want. Great. Now, just for the sake of a little bit of completion, um, we also did the electronic properties uh, using the hybrid functional. Although these do affect the Seebeck coefficient and the sigma, that is electrical conductivity, but this has this doesn't play a very big role in, in the lattice thermal conductivity. Uh, but most of them are basically semiconductors. <clears throat> now, 
The third criterion of Slack was that we needed high phonon scattering. Now, compare, let's look at the look, let's look at our structure, which is basically AX1. So INS1 and INSE1. This is the structure that we have proposed. And INS2 and INSE2 is the structure which was already studied in literature. We can see that for our structure within the acoustic region or low frequency region, there is more bunching of phonons, which means that there will be more scattering of phonons. So more bunching means that they are closer. The phonon branches are very closer and there should be more phonon scattering. Compared to AX2, which is on the right, on the left, which is AX1, for our structure, we can see that the bunching is actually more. And therefore, we can also qualitatively say that yes, for our structure, the phonon scattering is more. That means the third criterion of slack has also been satisfied. We are left with one more criterion, that is the last one, which is the high anharmonicity. So let's look at that. So we can see, um, let's look at the graph at the bottom, which is pink in color. That is the Grunaisen parameter. The Grunaisen parameter basically quantifies the anharmonicity. Here we can see that within the acoustic region, the Grunaisen parameter has a value of minus 45. This is huge. Like, I don't care if it's negative or positive, but this is a very, very big number. So, uh, but if it was very close to zero, that means it would be mostly harmonic, but it is not close to zero. In our case, in this material, it is actually very far from zero, which means it's very big. That means it is highly anharmonic, which means that my fourth criterion of slack has also been fulfilled. So we have basically satisfied all the four criteria due to slack. Because all these four criteria have been satisfied, I can qualitatively say from a guess that, yes, good, we want everything that we have, uh, or we have everything that we want, sorry. And now my thermal conductivity, my lattice thermal conductivity will probably be quite low. This is my guess. Okay. So, these are the lattice thermal conductivities for all the structures that we studied. So on the left-hand side, so INS1, INSE1, these are our structures, AX1. And on the right-hand side, like INS2, INSE2, these are AX2. These are the structures which already existed in literature. You can see that if you compare INS1 with INS2, the black line represents kappa L, or the lattice thermal conductivity. You can see that for INS1, it is almost 100 times lower than INS2. That means for our structure, for AX1, the lattice thermal conductivity is, is much, much lower than that of AX2. You can see the same thing for the other structures, INSE1, INSE2, INT1, INT2. If you compare, it's always like a, almost like a factor of 150, 100, etc. That means our guess was correct our thermal conductivity, our lattice thermal conductivity is super low. This is something we call ultra low lattice thermal conductivity. So we are happy with this result. That means now the final aim of this paper was to calculate not only the thermal conductivity, but also the thermoelectric figure of merit. That how, can, how much can we improve ZT? How much can we increase ZT? How much can, like, it has to be more than one as far as possible. So if you remember for the, uh, from that first equation that I showed you, ZT depended on Seebeck coefficient, which is S, sigma, which is electrical conductivity, temperature, kappa L, which is the lattice thermal conductivity, and kappa E, which is the electronic thermal conductivity. So using Bolstrap, we found these results for S, sigma, and kappa E. And I already showed you the values of kappa L in the previous slide. So when we plug in all these numbers into that equation for ZT, what we get is this. So you can see that for 
uh, maybe not for the Gallium series, but for the Indium series and uh, for the, yeah, for INS, INSE, INTE, our ZT, which is in green, is much higher than what is seen in AX2, that is INSE2, INS2, INT2, you see that it's much, much larger, huge. It's almost at the values of like 1.75. In fact, if you look at figure uh, D over here, it's almost, it's actually more than five. This is huge. This is massive. So this is exactly what we were looking for, that can we increase ZT as much as possible? And we have done that. We have done that successfully because we were able to reduce the kappa L very, very much. In AX2 materials, that is the material which has already been studied a lot, the kappa L is not that low. But in our material, AX1, the kappa L is very low, ultra low. Okay. Uh, this is also basically for the thallium series. Again, you can see that values are more than four, two, et cetera. So these results were published in, um, in two different journals. So uh, the first one came out in 2020. It was in applied ACS Applied Energy Materials. And the other one came out two years ago in Nano Energy. And these were both published in collaboration with my collaborator in India and my uh, uh, postdoc supervisor at the University of Uppsala, Rajiv Ahuja. And it's basically from Rajiv Ahuja's lab that I know, Nabil. So, um, and that's where I started working on thermoelectric materials. Okay, so what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that just by changing the orientation of the atoms in AX2, the chalcogen atoms were outside and the group 13 atoms were in the inner planes. In our system, we just changed the position. In our system, the chalcogen atoms are in the middle planes, inside planes, and the group 13 occupied the outer planes. So what happened? We saw that the bonds became weaker. The D by and because the bonds became weaker, the D by temperature decreased as well. More phonon scattering occurred. We saw that, that for our system, more phonon bunching ha happened and more scattering happened. And as a result of which, and we also saw that in our system, the anharmonicity was huge, massive. And therefore, the lattice thermal conductivity, kappa L, decreased drastically. As a result of which, the thermoelectric figure of merit increased a lot. So, uh, now, what are we doing next? I'm still trying to work on these things. So if we consider four, because in our approximations, when we did Sheng BTE, when we were calculating the lattice thermal conductivity, we calculated um, using three phonon scattering. But uh, we can actually use four phonon scattering as well, which will change the results a lot. And apart from that, another thing is that um, when we are calculating the electrical transport properties, for example, uh, Seebeck coefficient or sigma, et cetera, the relaxation time that we are using is not completely accurate. We can actually bring in more effects like uh, isotope scattering and uh, piezoelectric scattering, uh, electron phonon scattering, et cetera. And that will change the results a lot. And that will actually decrease the ZT significantly. So the ZT that I showed like four or five, that will probably come down to two or three maybe. So that is a very, very crucial thing that we have to address. But those calculations are very difficult. And we are trying our best to figure that out. So those are the more, mostly the next steps. And these days there is machine learning as well. A lot of groups are working on these same problems using machine learning, which I also have done um, to an extent. And it's always good to check if the DFT results match with the machine learning results or not, and which one is accurate. So that was it. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. You can always email me or find me on LinkedIn. And I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arnab. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I think your, uh, your talk will be serving as a great start point, starting point for all our colloquium. So please, if anyone uh, in the participants has a question and want to ask a question, please follow. I think I have one question, Arnab. 
Yeah. Starting from the, the last point you, you, you mentioned about machine learning and density yeah. functional theory, yeah. is there any uh, correlation between geometrical structure of the material and thermal conductivity or phonon scattering? Because if there is any, like if there is any uh, correlation between these two quantities, then it will be more easier for us like to predict the thermal conductivity and whatever related to thermal uh, thermoelectric properties based on the geometrical structure of the material without any uh, density functional theory calculation, which is like consuming more time during the calculation. That's actually a very good question. So uh, yes, there is. Uh, but there is no such written rule anywhere. It's something more, something that people usually know. So uh, usually it is seen that, uh, that for certain crystal structures or phases, the thermal conductivity is higher. Yes. And for certain ones, it is lower as well. But yeah. again, it is not a universal rule, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, if we could find that universal, because in this case, you see that both the structures AX1 and AX2 belong to the same space group. They have the same yeah. identical structure, actually. So in, our case, yeah. so in our case, it's yeah. not a universal rule at all. But in some cases, yes. For instance, uh, if I'm not wrong, for cubic systems, um, some, for many cubic systems, the thermal conductivity tends to be higher. But again, it's not a it's not a completely universal rule. Yeah. Uh, another question. It's like it's it's always related to, to this approach of uh, rearrangement of uh, of atoms in two D materials. Will this with will, will this approach works for other two D materials? Because I noticed also one thing uh, in one of my recent work, also based on this strategy of uh, rearrangement of atoms in two D materials everything can can be changed uh, especially uh, uh, for example in the case of boronitrite for example it's like it's widely used in different applications but not in energy related application because of its wide band gap but based on this rearrangement of atoms approach everything can be changed and the, the wide band gap can be tuned to narrow band gap which is like uh, um, more appropriate for uh, appropriate for energy related applications. So, will this approach really uh, works for other two D materials or or not? Yeah. Ideally, it should, but there is a slight problem here. The problem yeah. is that uh, you know these materials are not very easy to synthesize in the lab. So, because the AX2 structure that I showed, which has been studied in the uh, in experiments and in, which has been studied a lot previously, that is actually the ground state structure. So that is why people work with that structure the most. The structure that I am showing, AX1, although everything is stable, th thermodynamically it's stable, dynamically it's stable, mechanically it's stable, but it is not the ground state. It is like a metastable state. Yeah. So metastable states are always more difficult to make. So if we can make it in the lab, if we can synthesize it in the lab, then yes, all these problems can be solved. And that in fact is a very big branch of, uh, of material science. It can we make structures not in the ground state, but metastable state. In the best state, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you. Please, if anyone has a question and want to ask Arnab any question, please. Okay, maybe I have one last question for me, uh, and it's always related to machine learning, <laughs> you know, because I I recently I was recently in Psyche uh, a conference uh, which okay. is normally devoted to uh, theoretical physics, but I was feeling like that uh, eighty percent of the talk was devoted to machine learning and how we can use okay. machine learning. So my question is, is there any any like thought how we can use machine learning for Thermal conductivity or thermal thermoelectric properties in general. Absolutely. Like any, any sure. So, that. Yeah. so there are actually um, I can think of maybe three, four methods right now. So the method that I am using currently with my other collaborators, it's called the moment tensor potential. It was developed in Russia, and um, 
it gives extremely accurate results, like possibly more accurate than DFT also, and uh, and super fast. So these results, like you know, when if I'm trying to use third order force constants and using Sheng BT, this can take a very long time to do the calculations. When I'm when, when I'm using moment tensor potential machine learning, I can do all these calculations in probably two days. So so that is actually very that that is one method. MTP, moment tensor potential. The other one is um, <clears throat> using uh, descriptors. So basically, yes. let's say AC as like atom-centered symmetry functions, where mm -hmm. we convert the structure into a tensor. And we for that, we need a lot of external data points, actually. For example, yeah. 10,000 thermal conductivities or 5,000 thermal conductivities. Um, so, so yeah, so there are different ways. So one is so the two, the two that I can think of would be ACSF uh, using descriptors. And the other one is using uh, moment tensor potential, which we get using MD, molecular dynamics. Yeah. So in both methods, I think it's like, it's, uh, I will not mention it's useless, but it's like, we need a huge data set. And to, exactly. to collect all this data set, it's like, we need to do more and more calculation. And right. if we do more and more calculation, it doesn't matter if we use machine learning or not anymore. <laughs> so yeah. th this is actually the idea because a lot of people now are talking about machine learning, but the idea to use machine learning, it's still a little bit like confused because right. all people who are using now machine learning, especially in our field, it's like they are like using machine learning based on the data set they got from calculation. So right. you still need to do a huge uh, right. You need to consume more and more time in calculation right. to get some data set. Right. So uh, I, I was thinking maybe if there is any, uh, but this 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 approach is a little bit I think more complicated. If we can apply machine learning to decrease the computing time of uh, of DFT calculation instead of spending, for example, more and more hours in optimizing your system, is there any way mm -hmm. we can reduce this time? Uh, uh, consuming or not yeah i think this is this is the the idea some some researchers are working on right now yeah yeah exactly yeah. that's true i have not worked on that to be honest yeah uh, there's a question from the yes. yeah yes i think yes please jamal if you have any question okay. uh hello hi hi hello 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 uh thank you for this uh <laughs> For this uh, information, uh, I have a question about uh, thermal conductivity. Okay. So we know uh, as a bootstrap, we can't uh, determine this parameter. Just we can, with bootstrap, determine it, uh, electrical conductivity. Right. So how we can determine uh, the thermal conductivity. Right. So as you, I'll show you. Right. So the thermal conductivity, we used uh, a code called Sheng BTE. It's actually very simple to use, uh, but a lot of calculations need to be done, but it's very simple to use and it's very good. So this is tested. We have tested this code with many known materials also like graphene, diamond, boron nitride, etc. And they match the results match very well. So yes, so we always calculate, at least I always calculate thermal conductivity using Sheng BT. Yes. Hello? Hello, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, but I I found the many paper do not uh, calculate this, uh, this parameter, kappa parameter, just uh, calculate uh, or include uh, electrical conductivity. Yes. So, so what happened was that calculating the Sheng BTE parameter kappa L is actually very. It takes a lot of time. So okay. earlier people would not calculate it, and they would only calculate using bootstrap. And but exactly. yes, but but calculating the results from only using bootstrap gives us wrong results. So. To improve the results, we use Sheng BTE. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thanks. Welcome. 
One more question, Arnab, uh, for the third order force concerns. Yeah. Uh, normally, in two order force concerns, using phonopy, it's like we, uh, if we use like displacement method, it's like we generate based on the first structure, uh, other structure based on the displacement method. But once we go to third order, it's like we need to to, gen to generate more and more. And yes. And if 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 our system contains more than ten atoms, for example, if you have any estimation how many displacements method uh, can generate or postcards, right? So that depends. It does not depend on the number of atoms. It actually depends on the symmetry. S symmetry, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, for instance, for let's say for graphene, yeah. uh, you only generate one postcard because it yeah. is very highly symmetric. Um, so, for cubic or for um, tetragonal systems or for hexagonal systems, the number of postcards formed is quite low because it's very symmetric. But if mm -hmm. we go to monoclinic, then it becomes huge. So uh, like you can even generate uh, maybe around 1000 postcards. Yeah, yeah. And for this two, if had this family of 2D uh, calcogenide, it's uh, how much the estimation? I, I think it's seven in order of 700 postcard or something like that. Uh, no. So for my, you mean for my material? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was around, I would say, I think around, if I'm not, uh, I think around 300. 300. And for, for each postcard, you need to do like a single point calculation or? Yes, exactly. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. Okay, if, if there is no any other question, then we, we close. Thank you very thank much you. for the opportunity. Thank you very much. It was yeah. great to see you after such a long time. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. It was an honor to, to host you here to talk about your research about this paper, which is like a huge paper with, uh, just to, to list other notes, this paper is published in Nano Energy and contains more than 250 figures. It's a huge uh, uh, paper in which he screened so many materials in this family of 2D calcogenide and studied all these thermal uh, properties. So thank you very much, Arnab, for coming and talk about your research. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> See you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.